I'll go ahead, Spira. Okay, you're seeing my screen and everything is up, looks okay. We are, yes. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, let's move on from this trimpy effect, which is kind of weird, and to something which is even weirder, uh, which is these long delayed radio echoes. And uh, it's a little bit on the side of this conference, but I'm also on the side because I'm at 59 degrees and 50 minutes, so I'm just at the edge of the mid latitudes I've learned today. But um, I hope that my audio is working now. And I'm going to play uh, an example from Newfoundland. Oops. Uh, did did my audio come out uh, okay? That huh? that sounded great. Okay, so this is uh, Larry Horlick in Newfoundland who was listening to an amateur radio operator 15 kilometers away, and there is a delay of something a li little less than 0.3 uh, seconds in the 80 meter band, and then we have a CW station because these are kind these things are kind of difficult to um, uh, judge the delay on uh, on voice signals. Now he's going to play audio, but it's in uh, or Morse code, but it's in Danish, and he's going to say yes, it's weird enough, and then he's hearing the echo, and now it's there again. And the Danish is here if you want to follow it. Especially notice this letter, which is particular. This is also in the 80 meter band, and he measured it to 260 milliseconds. So you, you, you can hear how he's hearing his own echo coming back and it's getting stronger and stronger and he sort of gets disturbed by it. Now what has happened to these things and where have they been? And um, I'm, uh, I'm not really working in ionosphere physics. I'm, uh, I'm in the physics department as you can see, but I work with signal processing and acoustic imaging, especially for medical ultrasound, but I've been more and more interested in these um, uh, weird uh, propagation phenomena, but with ultrasound, uh, working with uh, wave equations and even wave equations with non-integer um, partial derivatives and stuff like that. But this kind of phenomenon is, is sort of interests me for another reason as well, and that is that it was first observed in Oslo in 1927 by Jürgen Hals. His picture is here. He was a civil engineer. He had his own construction company building houses in the in the city of Oslo, I think. And his house is there. It's it's still standing. I I, I even went there and and uh, looked at it. It's it's one it's in one of the more wealthy areas of, uh, of Oslo and this is his radio station it's kind of uh, hard to see what it is but <clears throat> this phenomenon attracted so much uh, attention that the main newspaper in Oslo had um, several stories about uh, about the phenomenon and uh, what he did was that <clears throat> he reported it to his neighbor which is this guy Carl Stedmer who was a professor at the University of Oslo in physics and math or mathematics. And um, Carl Sturmer then later reported in Nature in November 1928. I was kind of um, surprised that he was the sole author here, but uh, maybe that was what they did in 1928. I don't think he could have done this today because he he sort of repeated the letter from, uh, from Jürgen Hals about the phenomenon. I went to the National Library of Oslo and uh, tried to dig up his correspondence because it's there, it's, there's a lot of it, and I found the original letter, which I had thought was in Norwegian, but it wasn't. And so what he's saying is that he heard repeatedly signals from the Dutch shortwave transmitter PCJJ in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and he heard the main signal, this was, tel uh, this was Morse code, uh, and then he also heard an echo, which uh, or uh, a repeat, which came uh, one seventh of a second after it, which is around the world. And then he had another echo three seconds later. Uh, and the, he, he judged the amplitude to be 
one tenth or one twentieth of the main single. Now, first of all, this tells us that this was the um, um, peak uh, solar period in 1927. You heard the, his, the round the world echo, but it's three seconds. And what this resulted in was that they did some tests from this uh, this station, uh, Eindhoven or Hilversum, I don't know. It's, it's in the Netherlands, 9.5 megahertz. And this was reported by Van der Poel in Nature uh, later the same year. And they heard what they have here is uh, transmissions, and they have echo from 0 to 30 seconds. So here is <coughs> one echo, 13 seconds, heard in Oslo, s several ones up to 30 seconds. Here are simultaneous echoes in Oslo and Eindhoven, simultaneous two places in Eindhoven and, and Oslo, and so on. And so there are simultaneous observations of the same echo in two different countries. So this convinced uh, most skeptics that the effect was real, and they started the big measurement campaign, but they couldn't conclude on what this really was. And so there, <coughs> there are there's really five mechanisms which are considered for this around the world: this reflections in plasma clouds, and the one which I think has um, might be something that, that these waves are converted into mechanical waves in the ionosphere, and there is a. Uh, um, they are traveling like one kilometer per second and then converted back and these are these things have been heard with EME as well so they could be two EME singles and the difference is converted and converted back but the one which is understood and which will uh, I will focus on here and which my examples were about was the ducting in the magnetosphere and um, you can read about this uh, I have a um, a page at the University of Oslo on the five most likely explanations, which come from this paper by Widmer and Crawford in 1985. There's also a larger set of uh, possible explanations, 15 different ones, which I also have a page on. They're both referenced in the Wikipedia page. This includes, for instance, a, a, a echo to the moon two and a half seconds. So it's, uh, it's also a known effect. Now, here are some. Um, uh, more examples. I, I've plotted, um, this is the Earth, these are the magnetic uh, field lines. There is one for 143 milliseconds, which corresponds to Georgia in 2006. Could be also around the world, 138 milliseconds. Uh, uh, Peter Martinez, G3 PLX, heard, had a big measurement campaign. He heard this 59 times over a period of 10 years at different frequencies from 2 to 3.9. And that's this path. Um, he also heard and a double echo. So his single went to the southern hemisphere, back to himself, and a second trip. Uh, Tasmania goes the other way from the southern to the northern and back at 1.9 megahertz. That's the third one. And the largest one, th more than 300 milliseconds. St. Petersburg in, in the mid 80s, 1.8 megahertz, also a double echo. Now, this has been uh, investigated in the uh, scientific literature and especially with these um, satellites, Alouette and Explorer 20. And, um, and it's uh, from these top side sounders, this is experienced much more often. Uh, and also in the ham radio uh, literature in QST in 1980 with. with uh, um, with the same uh, Mul Mul uh, Muldrew from uh, from some university in Quebec, I think. Um, and the big largest um, investigation was really done by part Peter Martinez and was published in Radcom, the British magazine for ham radio, in October 2007. And uh, I was working with uh, Steve Nichols uh, in the propagation committee of Radcom this, this week, and we were able to make this paper for the first time publicly available on the RSGB, RSGB propagation page on uh, long delayed echoes. Now here is a report from um, K44MOG um, uh, in Georgia and uh, this is QST in, uh, in 2007 and he claimed it to be an around the earth path because the echo was uh, in the vicinity of 138 milliseconds <coughs> and he was thought it was some other one, other people sending on his own frequency until he realized that it was his own echo. I wrote a paper because I th 
couple of years later because I think this was really a magnetospheric uh, ducting phenomenon and not the round the world echo because we'll never figure out but at 3.5 megahertz it's very rare to have signals going around the world. <coughs> this is the Danish uh, report that I played to you from Paul Erik Karse also in 2009 and he did quite good measurements of it actually. The same phenomenon he thought someone else was uh, transmitting until he realized it was his own signal. Now the explanation for this is uh, is that there are some field-aligned guided uh, uh, gu uh, or ducts or troughs in the ionosphere and this seems to be related to some asymmetry between the hemispheres and something with the winds in the ionosphere. Um, but the net result is a diminishing of the electron density by about 1% and this is something which is like one to two kilometers across and stretches along the uh, magnetic field line from the F layer of one hemisphere to the other. And this works as a waveguide if it's less than something like 10 wavelengths and it means that it works up to 5 megahertz. Somewhat related to the Whistler effect but the, I, think the, I think the ducts for Whistlers are much wider than this and so it's a somewhat different phenomenon. The interesting thing is that the signal which goes all, all the way to the other hemisphere and back is 40 dB stronger than if it had traveled the same distance in free space. So it's very focused. And um, you, can, um, you, can con you can compute these uh, um, um, paths, have to convert your uh, uh, geographical latitude longitude to geomagnetic because it all depends on magnetic field. And, uh, and you can uh, integrate the path, and the path has a fairly simple formula for magnetic field lines. Now, there is a problem with these reports, and that is that uh, people are not really set up for measuring delays uh, with ham radio equipment. And ham radio equipment is not made for me measuring these kinds of delays. So I measured in my K3, for instance, that when I transmit, first the side tone is turned on, and then the RF nicely shaped uh, turns on then there is a delay of 15 milliseconds so that's on the transmitter side now when I receive uh, the the scale here is different but I receive RF then the uh, tone the audio comes on here up to 35 milliseconds later this is a 50 Hertz uh, bandwidth so it's a very slow rise here and this is about the largest delay I could uh, find in the G in the, in the K3 turning on the uh, uh, noise reduction and stuff like that, all the DSP stuff. So so it means that if you measure from audio to audio, you measure 50 milliseconds too much. In my K2, on the other hand, which is a purely analog uh, transceiver uh, and it doesn't have any DSP option, this is only 12 milliseconds. So you have to know these delays to measure it. Now I want to play some more examples. I want to play this um, from Georgia, the, uh, which is, can be confused with uh, around the world. I have to change my pointer, I guess. Oh. How do I get my... Uh, normal pointer back. <laughs> I had to just uh, go out of my presentation and go back again. Sorry. Okay, so here's the uh, K3, K4 MOG. Oh, did I turn on the light sound again? Or? Are you are you hearing this? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you're hearing that there is a Doppler shift as well here. So there is some movement in the ionosphere. Um, and um, G3. PLX did a very professional job. He, he had lots of frequencies available, so he's in, in the business of RF, I think, uh, um, 
more efficiently in the UK. Some chirps. And then I had uh, I have written about this on my on my blog. So I've had lots of people contact me with examples. This is from W2PA in the New York. Now you're not hearing his own transmission here. So you're just hearing a click and then then the echo. So it's a kind of little bit harder to to judge what is going on there, but it's it's a real echo. Um, so it's, it varies from 126. Uh, this is in Northern California. They unfortunately they lost the recording KM6I. I tried to contact him, but it lost it. And up to 300 milliseconds. These are the examples I have. So conditions for this to happen is that um, it's it's up to four megahertz. It, it, so it happens in the 160 and 80 meters band. It can also happen in the AM uh, um, medium wave band. The, uh, normal broadcasting best in the winter in the northern hemisphere so that's uh, d especially december january less likely in february and november and you can see a pattern here november february january december november uh, and so on and uh, in the evening in local time which means that you're traveling along uh, magnetic field lines which are in the darkness not uh, not uh, under the influence of the solar pressure and most likely during years of low solar ac activity and the poorer antenna you have the lower the better because then it radiates up into the mag magnetic field and you, you have to be very close to the duct entry point so some 20s maybe 50 kilometers seems to be what i've learned from the examples i've gotten and then you have to exit the ionosphere so here from the northern hemisphere you have to have a low F2 critical frequency where you are located with your transmitter and then it reflects on the other side and there you have to have a high um, uh, F2 critical frequency. So first you need a duct, then you need a low F2 critical frequency where you are, then you need a high one on the reflection points on the other hemisphere. So there's a lot of conditions for this to happen. So um, uh, I'm going to wrap up here. So from 1927 until today we have all these long really long echoes from 3 to 30 seconds we really don't call them long delayed echoes until unless they are longer than a moon echo two and a half seconds and it happened from all the way for up to 1296 megahertz so eme also there's been serious tests in norway netherlands france us uk soviet union without any real conclusions most observations are from radio amateurs and there's a lot of people who will tell you about this but they have they may not remember the frequency time of day or whatever because the observations are not very strictly performed the only one which is performed which is understood is the magnetospheric duct and uh, interestingly g3 plx said i'm tempted to suggest that magnetospheric ducts may never be more than a rare scientific curiosity and i think i agree with him and Jürgen Hultz, the original observer of this, said in 1928, from where this echo comes, I cannot say for the present, but I will only herewith confirm that I really heard this echo. So with that, I want to thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. Let's see. I'm sure there are a few questions out there. Uh, Carl, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I captured uh, four of them. Uh, one was from Greg, and he asked, uh, is it typical that the, uh, the the echo is greater amplitude than the original signal? Was that a, a magnetospheric ducted signal? Or? Oh, I don't know. It's just uh, the echo coming back. <laughs> yeah. No, because, uh, because with these ducts, they are so focused that uh, the signal is 40 dB. Like I said, someone is suggesting like 40 dB stronger than if it were free space propagation. So in that case, I think it, and it sounded in my examples also that it's the same amplitude. Now we are fooled by AGC sometimes in these cases because we are don't really have measurement equipment when we have AGC. So kind of hard to say, I think, but uh, okay. yeah, I think they can be really strong. Okay, Elizabeth asked or, or made a comment that looking for latitude trend would be good too. 
Yeah, especially for those other phenomena, the longer, the three to 30 second uh, um, echoes um, would be very interesting. Now, I've, uh, I, I didn't say that, but in my table here, every time I have this tilde, this is my estimate from position and, magne and geomagnetic latitude. The professional ones in the in the literature are measured, and my estimate is that uh, just looking at the magnetic field line finds the delay by some plus minus five to ten milliseconds. Uh, so so th there is a clear latitude geomagnetic latitude effect, especially for this phenomenon. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next speaker.